Good morning. Hi, Patty. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for being here. All right. I'll just wait another moment till nine. I have the air conditioner on again, so if you find it's kind of making a background hum or too loud, you can let me know and I will mm, turn it down or off. All right. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, nine o'clock, good morning. Um, yeah, so uh, hi, Carolyn and Monty. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to this True North Insight place of practice, place of community, place of safety, and place hopefully of stepping into uh, this world with compassion and wisdom. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to start today with um, reading a short piece from a Dharma teacher. Uh, her name is Spring Washam. I'll put her name here for those who would like to look her up. Washam. And yeah, so you can just um, settle in and, and see uh, how these words land for you. Uh, so Spring says, it's so interesting how three words can evoke so much in our society right now. Black lives matter. These three words are so perfect and complete in and of themselves. Seeing these three words and saying these three words out loud ev invokes so much emotion for people. Fear, hatred, and outrage mixed with righteous indignation. The absolute genius in these three words is that they immediately reveal ourselves to ourselves. How do we feel when we say it? Are we even able to say it? If not, why? Be curious about that. She says, I am discovering the great power in this simple statement of truth, Black Lives Matter. Every time I say these words, I am breaking open something deep within my own heart. The program of white supremacy depends upon my belief in my own inferiority that somehow I don't matter. It depends on me hating myself and devaluing myself because of my own brown skin. It depends on you hating me too. This is deep stuff. If you haven't said these three words, I really encourage you to say them and then sit in the great mystery of what it reveals. Try to listen with the heart. It's deep medicine because we are breaking a powerful program that has been operating for 400 years. It's medicine for real. Deep medicine, isn't that something to, good morning, Giti, good morning, Rebecca, to, to say these three words out loud Black Lives Matter, and then to just sit into the awareness with your own heart to see what's revealed. This is 
beautiful and powerful. Does all the energy pop back up, back up into the mind and debating and confusion and arguing and the yeah buts, you know, or can the heart uh, feel Black Lives Matter? It's a great practice. Good morning, Terry. Um, so on that note, I want to take this time to read and say these words out loud from True North Insights, guiding teachers board and all of the volunteers and um, all of the teachers, all of us from True North Insight. And this is our commitment to dismantling racism and oppression. Something we've been working on for many years and and just beginning the journey. So I'm just going to read this. Um, and you can see, you know, just rest and see what what is revealed for you. George Floyd's murder has prompted the world to wake up once again, once again. And True North Insight is not exempt. And the needless deaths of many, many, many more. I could spend this whole hour and more uh, listing names. All of these deaths demonstrate that Canada is not exempt from racist violence against black and indigenous and brown bodies, brown people, black, indigenous and brown people. These acts are held up by Canada's own systems of racism and white supremacy. Although we know that we have a lot of work to do, True North Insight is in solidarity. Oh, sorry, Linda. True North Insight is in solidarity with the sea of bodies marching to demonstrate against anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. And we echo the cry that we must all do better. True North Insight is committed to dismantling racism and oppression. We have made a start towards building a Sangha that reflects the community, that reflects the aspiration of a truly inclusive community. But we know that we still have a long road ahead. So True North Insight is committed to training and financially supporting more Black and Indigenous teachers. Um, and we've created a new fund that I've linked down below so that any Donna you're able to give today, um, uh, there's two links. And one is to this new fund to support more um, Black, Indigenous, Brown, Dharma teachers, POC, people of color. Um, and increasing teaching opportunities for them. Offering free registration for Black and Indigenous people for upcoming online retreats. Offering practice spaces that represent our deepest values of equity, access, and meaningful inclusion. Of course, this includes physical access for um, people that are physically um, differently abled. Yes, we do, Linda. And, um, and okay, um, and, uh, and to LGBTQIA um, inclusion. Uh, so we have um, also a queer Sangha and we have retreats for LGBTQ uh, folks. Starting a white privileged caucus group that will tackle whiteness and white supremacy with Buddhist practice as the foundation. So this is in the works and you can, you'll hear more about this soon, which will be a safe place for uh, white folks to come and uh, dismantle and learn our own internalized racism. Increasing the number of black, indigenous and people of color teachers for future retreats. Continuing to host and or financially support equity and inclusion trainings for board members, staff, and teachers. Continuing to offer inclusion scholarships for Black, Indigenous, people of color to attend retreats. So that link is also down below. It's a scholarship fund to support 
um, that particular community to be able to attend retreats. Continuing to offer Black, Indigenous, people of color sitting groups and an annual BIPOC retreat, which uh, we have a weekly sitting group online right now, in person uh, when not everything is online, and um, designated retreats. Continuing to share resources that educate and untrain minds and hearts from conditioned biases that keep the status quo of inequity going in society. And the resources for that are on our True North Insight page, our equity and inclusion page. So we really recognize that this is a partial list of what's possible and does not provide enough measurable detail. We're centering commitment on inclusion um, into our this Sangha uh, during our strategic planning board meetings um, in September, where we'll be able to create a more detailed plan. Um, so encouragement, if you feel moved to um, support those funds so we can continue growing uh, with these intentions. Uh, as Dharma teacher Lama Rod Owens cautioned, if we don't do our work, then we become work for other people. Okay, so I wanted to take time just to really read this out loud, read this statement, and um, give it voice. So thank you for that. Today, um, today is summer solstice. It's a day of the longest day of the light, the greatest light, the brightness of illumination. And it's also a time of turning into the longer nights, you know. So this is, a, you know, a really for me, you know, metaphorically, symbolically, this represents like shine the light into the dark corners. This is so happening right now, totally happening. Um, but into the corners of our hearts as well, as well as, all, you know, all of the spaces. So I, I named this talk today, Rounding the Corners, um, because of this uh, poem inspired me. It's anonymous, but it comes from the book, A um, Hundred Poems to Lift Your Spirits. Yay. <laughs> anonymous. Thank you, anonymous poet. It's called Corners on the Curving Sky. Our earth is round. And among other things, it means that you and I can hold completely different points of view and both be right. The difference of our positions will show stars in your window. I cannot even imagine. Your sky may burn with light while mine at the same moment spreads beautiful to darkness. Still, we must choose how we separately corner the circling universe of our own experience. Once chosen, our cornering will determine the message of any star and darkness we encounter. Yeah, so do, do we get ourselves into our corner? We make a corner out of the roundness of of our reality that you know we're we're all living such different truth different experiences and we get ourselves locked into our corner our view our perception you know which of course affects our perceptions and um How do we meet? This is what I've really been struggling with, is how do we meet? How do we transform? How do we transmute this, these divides? Well, illumination is one way, and the path, right intention, right action, right speech, 
is what guides me anyways and uh, on my good days as best as I can. And I, I, I've really been aware because I have young adults in my family and I uh, was yesterday hanging out with a young man and, and just, uh, <laughs> it seems to me that the younger generations <laughs> I'm of that age now where I can say those younger generations um, don't seem, and I don't know, you know, in their heart, I'm sure they are still, I know they are still shocked and dismayed, but on some level, they're not as surprised at how things are right now because they've been ready for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> it sounds absurd, to, uh, but really, they like I remember this with my kids, our kids that they they like zombie movies, zombie video games, apocalyptic movies. You know, there's just a plethora of of them that wasn't part of my childhood. It was you know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and all that stuff but um dr doolittle <laughs> and well even in all those there's a lot of mess messages of the dark and light so anyways it, it just feels to me that they've been aware of this for some time because they they've been raised in this interconnected interwebs of information they know about how things are around the world and primarily they know about the the state of the earth and what we have done through greed um, in the devastation of the earth so this idea of apocalypse uh, I didn't know this till a, a wise friend and teacher posted this yesterday about, um, and then this is from the dictionary that I've looked this up to confirm it because I was like, what? That's amazing. Apocalypse is a Greek word that means revelation, an unveiling or unfolding of things not previously known and which could not be known apart from the unveiling. Isn't that awesome? That's so great. And this is just one apocalypse. There has been many apocalypses through history and through time. And remember when all this pandemic and now all the, un uh, the pain and unrest and division, uh, I was like, I really didn't, to have a sense that I was going to live through this again. I kind of thought that we'd conquered plagues uh, wrong. So revelation, apocalypse, means reveal. And this is, again, this solstice light, illuminate the dark corners. You know, let it, let it come out. Um, so things are being revealed for what they are, and lots of it we don't want to see. It's very, very shocking, painful, hard to see. Um, but here we are, and and in even though it's very hard, painful, some of the things that are being done and said, of course are uh, sh shocking and um, but it's being revealed so what do we do now um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been having conversations with very various folks um, to try and get some clarity for myself personally and uh, these, these, 
uh, th these words are from a conversation shared last night with uh, and yesterday afternoon with um, some artist friends of mine, uh, Andrea and Dan, who um, ha have often undertaken this amazing process of co-creating art together, like four hands on one canvas. <laughs> Wow, it's hard enough with two hands, but <laughs> uh, and and how much they learned and how much is it unveiled in that process of creating, you know, which end up being beautiful, powerful pieces of art, uh, but this process of sharing together and um, it's kind of like these two worlds colliding that is happening right now in our world, in the difficult conversations, in the polarized views. And how do we let go of the outcome? Because if you're just focused on creating that piece of art or getting to the place of peace, then you can't figure out how to be in, in the muck. Or I can't anyways. If you have um, insights, please share them. So to allow these painful conversations as much as we're safe to do, as much as we can have the capacity to do. And to what's I think really been hard is to not know where it's going. It's out of my control, the outcome, where it's going. And but still mm, be willing to step into that not knowing. Because I want to know that it's going to go in the direction that I think is right, you know, and so that's my corner I'm in. Um, and it doesn't create a conversation. So uh, Andrew was sh sharing that when they are co-creating a piece of art together, the mind will like somebody will do something on the canvas and the mind will say, that's wrong or why'd you put that there that's not where i thought it was going um and and when you get into that place not much else can happen the thing freezes right and uh she said when making a painting and a mistake happens it takes us to somewhere that often feels wrong and then that often becomes the most powerful place And, and it's, it took them, you know, however many, many years of co-creating a life together, a very safe and honest relationship, a loving, trusting relationship of, to be able to do that process together, you know. And here we are jumping into it with strangers trying to do this work. Um, so she was saying, you know, sometimes you just have to take a break from it. You have to step back to see the larger picture. Um, and the most important thing in the process is the co-creating. We can't, um, we, to get through this, I think we have to co-create what is possible, what is next, as much as we can. Um, and it's right in that mucky place that the transformation can happen in, 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 in the art and in the art of life. It's right in this. We're so in the muck right now. But really, when we turn this light, this bright light of solstice, this bright light of compassion, of truth, um, to our own hearts and minds, can we really acknowledge that within us are also the seeds of greed, hatred, and delusion? Within ourselves, within this self, I'll speak for myself, um, you know, where do I draw the line if something horrific and violent, a physical attack was happening to my, one of my kids or, or, or a, any child? Or, you know, where, wherever places we draw the line, 
what am I capable of doing to stop that happening? You know, what what rage is within me? What unkindness is seeds are within me? And for anybody that uh, says, well, not me, as some do, oh, I'm not, no, I'm completely free. Well, okay, you're a Buddha, you're an enlightened one, or maybe not, look deeply, look deeply. <laughs> so this is the process I'm doing, shining the light into my own dark corners, because I can't do that for anyone else, to illuminate my own ignorance, acknowledge my fears. I think so much uh, unskillfulness comes from fear. And so when I reflect on that for myself, what is my fear? Wow. My fear is that this is just going to become another cycle going around again. 400 years. Another, you know, just wave of uprising. And the systems aren't going to change. That's my fear. And so when I'm acting from that place of fear, I get really reactionary and really um, aggressive, assertive. I get into a fighting place. Um, and that's not helpful at all. So then I step away from the painting, step away from the conversation, do my own healing work, etc. cetera. Um, stay in the body, out of the head. Yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh says it this way in his book, Peace is Every Step. When we are angry, we are not usually inclined to return to ourselves, right? We want to think about the person who's making us angry, to think about his hateful aspects, his rudeness, dishonesty, cruelty, maliciousness, and so on. The more we think about him, listen to him, look at him, the more our anger flares. His dishonesty and hatefulness may be real, imaginary, or exaggerated, but in fact, the root of the problem is the anger itself. And we have to come back and look, first of all, inside ourselves. It is best if we do not listen to or look at the person whom we consider to be the cause of our anger. Take a break. Like a fireman, we have to pour water on the blaze first and not waste time looking for the one who set the house on fire. We have to put out the fires within us. This does not mean spiritual bypassing. This does not mean, you know, all of that. It means calm the fires within your own heart and mind so that you can respond skillfully, truthfully, with right effort, right speech, is it the right time? So on right speech, you know, if you think this is too much about my personal <laughs> challenge, I'll just give you some dharma now. Uh, <laughs> I, to me, it's all dharma. But um, so this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, um, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's um, editing of the Buddha's teaching on social and communal harmony. It's a fabulous book, and I've been pulling it out a lot lately. Um, here we go. There you go. Beautiful book. Nice little book. And, and lots of, lots of, you know, you can get, go to the index and just boom, right to some great support. Uh, so this. Those who speak with quarrelsome intent, the intent to quarrel, settled in their opinions, swollen with pride, ignoble, which means not honorable, not noble, honorable, having assailed virtues, which means attacking the virtues of others, 
looking for openings to attack one another. They mutually delight when their opponent speaks badly and makes a mistake. They rejoice in his bewilderment and defeat. But noble ones don't engage in such talk. If a wise person wants to talk, having known the time is right, without quarrelsomeness or pride, the sagely person should utter the speech that the noble ones practice, which is connected with the Dhamma and meaning. So connected with the Dhamma, Dharma means Dhamma, Dharma, um, the nature of things, how things are, that all things are impermanent, and that clinging is the cause of suffering, that all things are interconnected and conditioned in their arising. Ah, that's big. So if I look at someone that I just go, boom, that's a racist. That police officer who spent seven minutes with his knee on George Floyd's neck and murdered him. How do I see that through Dhamma? How do I see the conditioning that brought that person to be in uh, expressing that action, doing that act. And I can see the conditioning. I can see, you know, in my heart's mind, I can open to some understanding of all the conditions that created that moment for both of them for all of the bystanders and for all of the witnesses and for all of us, like this is deep and big and wide and, we, and needs time and reflection. The sutta goes on not being insolent or aggressive <laughs> with a mind not elated one speaks free from envy on the basis of right knowledge. One should approve of what is well expressed, should not attack what is badly stated. <laughs> That's a hard one to do for me. So I'm just stay away for a bit. He should not train in fault finding, nor seize on the other's mistakes. Wow. One should not overwhelm and crush one's opponent, nor speak mendacious words i had to look that up that means lying truly a discussion and that's a tricky one lying because everybody thinks they're right when we're in our corner i have the right view you are distorted in your view you know so how do we understand what it is to not speak mendacious words not lying <clears throat> we have to speak from our direct personal experience this is what we can know is true. And to see the, you know, with the truth of interconnectedness, with the truth of compassion being the only way through this time, all times. Truly, a discussion among the good is for the sake of knowledge and confidence. Such is the way to dis the noble discuss things. This is the discussion of the noble ones. Having understood this, the wise person, person should not swell up, but should discuss things. <laughs> right on. So helpful. <laughs> so helpful. But as Thich Nhat Hanh said, when we are angry, we're not usually inclined to return to ourselves. You know, just wait for the right time. Shine the light on our inner fears and angers and greeds and delusions.
connect to the understanding of the conditioned nature of all things. Everybody in their corner has gotten there, including ourselves, from our conditioning, the teachings we've been exposed to, the community that we um, hang with, uh, you know, and so can we stretch? Can we just, we can't see the end of the painting, but can we just take the next step? That's all we have is this step, this breath, this moment. Okay, I need to stop talking. And and um, and <laughs> I need to stop talking, and then I say, and, and. Uh, you know, but I just want to end with, you know, how do we, how do we do this? All we can truly know is this moment. This moment is informed from the past moments. And in particular, I'm talking today about the past 400 years of uh, subjugation and uh, separation and violence. And um, so the, all of the past moments that inform this moment and uh, the intention for the intention for non-harm, the intention for non-creed, the intention for non-delusion, the intention for renunciation, letting go, what can we let go of to make more space, more uh, resource, more opportunity for others, more time? Um, yeah. And this is what takes us into the next step, the next moment, hopefully the uh, co-creation of something beautiful. Okay, we're going to have a practice and... Um, one more poem. Um, so that one was anonymous, but I'll put the name of it in case you're able to look it up. Corners of the Curving Sky. It's in the book um, 100, whoop, not 110, but maybe there's a new edition. 100 Poems to Lift Your Spirits. Beautiful. Uh, and this one is from, you know, Rosemary Wittola Tromer. And this uh, this poem is really what started this whole, what's come out as this talk today, uh, which I'll read to you in a moment. Making it right, a prophecy. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Hang in with me till you hear this. So good. And please know that Rosemary has published a new book and she gives away free poems every day. Um, and of course, then we try to support that act of generosity by buying their books, these poets and teachers. Okay, making it right, a prophecy. This is, this is, okay. <laughs> No wrong notes in jazz, said the musician. And the poet insisted, no wrong words. No wrong leaf, said the tree. And the field said, no wrong grass. No wrong time, promised the friend. And the river said, no wrong rock. And the heart said, no wrong love. But the mind said, no, that's wrong. And the wrong love replanted itself like grass and grew wild in all the wrong places, like a gorgeous weed, like a taprooted song until the whole field was beautifully wrong, wrong. There's so much to unpack in there. I'm just turning around, pardon me, to turn off this sign. Off. Ah, 
now you notice it's quiet. <laughs> I could, <clears throat> I'd love to have a conversation unpacking that uh, poem. There, it's amazing. You know, it's it's back into this round roundness of our world and um, no no wrong love. I can totally know that. And then the mind says, yeah, but that's wrong. <laughs> what you said is wrong. What you did was wrong, you know. And as soon as that happens, the wrong love replants itself like a grass and grows. <sighs> and yet somehow at the end of the poem, the whole field was beautifully wrong, wrong. Wow. This is where we are. We're in this muck. One person did something wrong on the, you know, wrong on the paint on the canvas. And it's like, oof, it's beautifully wrong, wrong. And uh, right now our world is wrong, wrong. Where is, how do we find the beauty in this? This is the illumination, the truth, um, our interconnectedness. And we need to, uh, I need to stay in my place of compassion. And compassion means action. Compassion, if we look this up in Pali, Karuna is an action. It, it, it's, not, uh, it's not just bypassing. Okay. I've talked too long. Let's... Uh, this practice is quieting our heart and mind, turning in. As Spring said, let your body find some rest. I know all the words really stir things up and I'm okay with that. So feel what is stirred. You know, as, as Spring was saying, say the words out loud and then feel what is the heart's response. What's here? Is there fear? You know, what are what are the guests that have come into the guest house? Stay in your seat as we practiced on Wednesday and acknowledge what's here. Is there fear? Is there anger? Doubt? Joy? What's here right now? Can we bring a compassionate heart and mind to our own despair? As Thich Nhat Hanh, it is very it said it's very uh, uncomfortable, and we're not we don't generally have a tendency to turn towards inner painful states. Like a firefighter, firefighter, we have to pour water on the blaze first and not waste time looking for the one who set the house on fire. We have to extinguish the flames so that we can then move into the world, into right action, right speech.
We quell the fires within our own hearts, minds, and bodies with a compassionate attention, mindfulness. Ah, it's like this. Noticing any contractions in the body can be a, a touch point, a signal that there's something asking for kind attention here. Are there areas of numbness, of walled, walled off spaces? And sometimes those are walls are there for a reason. So uh, we don't dismantle them. We just gently acknowledge. Listen with the heart as the great mystery reveals itself. And as you touch into these tender places within your own being, you uh, might find it helpful to kind of bring in your supports to help you with this work. Your Sangha, your community, friends sitting on at your sides, your ancestors who have your back and perhaps in front of us all beings and staying connected to your own deep uh, whatever is being revealed And uh, wishing, touching into this wish, may I be free from greed, from hatred, from delusion.
May my heart, mind be untethered from reactivity so that compassionate action can guide every moment. May I shine the light of illumination into the corners of my own being. From this place of deep connection with our own body, heart, mind, in this moment, feeling the infinite and radiant nature of the heart, connecting with each other here, here to practice untethering and feel our shared intentions. I'm wishing for each other, may you be safe in body, heart and mind. May you be peaceful. May you be skillful. And may we be agents of true compassion in the world. like a pebble dropped into a pond, just watching the ripples of the heart, trusting the ripples of the heart, feeling this expanding awareness. Include um, people that feel like they're in your closer circle. All of your family, friends, associates, people that you've been in communication with recently. And even within that smaller circle, there's different views, different skillfulness. Just feel into the body right now and extend this heart connection May you be safe in body, heart, and mind. May you be skillful. May you be peaceful. May you move into this world with true compassion.
Let that ripple widen into your wider community. Even more different views. Even more, every single life has a different story, different conditioning. And feel the heart's wish in connection with all these beings. May you be safe in body, heart, and mind. May you be peaceful and skillful. May you move into this world with true compassion. And without bringing this up into a concept in the mind, feel that the heart rippling even wider across the lines drawn in the sand, across all the borders and boundaries and walls, all the mine and yours. all those who have caused suffering, all those who are suffering. Including all beings everywhere, including our co-inhabitants on this earth. All the animal beings and winged, feathered, finned, many-legged, all the beings, the earth itself, may you be safe in body, heart, and mind. All beings without exception, may you be peaceful. May be skillful. May you move into this world with the heart of true compassion. May I, may you, May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. Such deep work right now. Um, do we have a few moments here for any comments, questions? What what is helping you? Um, yeah, just while uh, folks are uh, just giving time, if anybody wants to type anything, it kind of takes a moment to come through. Um, so an invitation on this day of illumination, of solstice, of another great turning, uh, invitation to um, those who are in this area, this community, Center Wellington's Solidarity March for Black Lives Matter. 
And uh, this is from 12 till 3 today, meeting at Victoria Park, the soccer field behind the Victoria Park Senior Center in town uh, for to hear speakers. And so if you're not able to walk, you could um, just come to the beginning part there to hear speakers. Everyone will be wearing a mask. Everyone will be keeping physical distancing rules. And, um, and then those that are physically able are um, invited to also join uh, the walk. Um, yeah. Lots to practice here in wise speech and wise action. Mm. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Thank you, Bisha. Bisha. Hmm. So please um, take care of yourselves and keep uh, asking for support. Keep coming together to find uh, safe places of community so we can continue um, our own inner work and um, which which uh, guides our response in the world. Hmm. Um, and I'm available if anybody wants uh, support and um, let me know. Okay. That's it. See you Wednesday evening if you're able. And um, I don't know what the date is these days. 20th. Holy mackerel. <laughs> um, I should have put the link down below, but uh, um, I apologize for not that, that foresight not being there. Um, so True North is Insight. Um, BIPOC online retreat is this weekend coming up online meditation retreats and uh, da -da, black indigenous people of color retreat June 27th to 28th amazing teachers Don Riccio, Josen, Tamori Gibson and Dara Williams um, and the amazing sliding scale uh, free $20, $40, $60, or $200 to be a supporter. So um, check that out, uh, True North Insight website, to um, read more about that and uh, participate if that is um, resonant for you. Okay. Peace. Bye.